Our gospel reading today comes from Matthew, third chapter, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. On the church calendar, this Sunday is known as Baptism of Our Lord Sunday. And it's based on this passage that we've just read in Matthew chapter 3. This is a historical account of the baptism of our Lord Jesus. Listen again to these words. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Proper, that means it's right. Righteousness, that which is right. All his life, Jesus did all the right things. He not only did all the right things, he did all the right things the right way. He did all the right things the right way with the right motives in the way that pleased his heavenly Father. And so, when Jesus was baptized, the scriptures tell us what happened. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Wow. The Spirit descended on him in a visible form as a dove. What Spirit? The Spirit of God. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Whose voice was it? It was the voice of his heavenly Father. He is our Father, too, when we place our faith in His Son, Jesus. As Christians, we, of course, are monotheistic. That's a big word, which simply means that we believe in only one God. The one true and living God who created everything that exists. This supreme being exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but only together one God. God. Please take note of the fact that this is the all-powerful God fully present at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus the Son was baptized. The Spirit of God descended and the Father spoke. Our three-in-one God is present, I believe, at each and every baptism. No, not usually in a visible, audible way. That is why Jesus commanded that we baptize believers in Him in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. The baptism of our Lord began His work of ministry, which was completed by His death on the cross, His resurrection from the grave, and His ascension. To his Father in heaven. When we place our faith in Jesus and commit our lives to him as our Lord and our Savior from sin, then we should follow his example by being baptized in his church at the first opportunity. The Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 2 and 38. Every believer who truly repents is instructed to be baptized, immersed in water. This command comes 
with a promise, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's Acts 2 and 39. Somebody asked me this week, is it necessary to be baptized in order to be saved? It's a question that I've heard asked before. Obviously, people wonder about that. I said no, and I mentioned the thief who was crucified on the cross next to the cross of our Lord. Perhaps you recall that he prayed, remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded, today you will be with me in paradise. The dying thief had no opportunity to be baptized. But for those believers who do have that opportunity, baptism is not an option. There is a sacred mystery associated with baptism. That is why it may be called a sacrament. I know that the BIC have traditionally preferred the term ordinance, describing it as a special event in the life of God's people. I personally prefer the term sacrament because there is something of a profound spiritual nature that is taking place. This is spoken about in Romans chapter 6, which Dave read for us earlier. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, the Bible says. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. The death that Jesus died, he died for us. He took our place on that cross. Therefore, I died with him when he died for me. When we go under the waters of baptism, we are united with him in his death. The Bible goes on to say, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. What a promise. This is incredible. Going under the water represents our death and burial with Jesus. Coming up from the water represents our resurrected life through him. Now consider this. Nothing that hasn't died can ever be resurrected. That's why I entitled the message today, Dying to Live. That is what I mean when I talk about dying to live. We begin to live the life which God intended for us when he created us in the first place. Jesus called it being born again, or being born from above. It happens by a supernatural act of God's Holy Spirit. Our old self, our sinful nature, was crucified with Jesus. Because of that, we are no longer slaves to sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that deviates from God's perfect standard. It means to miss the mark. It can be a thought, a word we speak, an action that is wrong and contrary to the nature of God. But the good news is we are no longer, as believers, slaves to sin. You see, before we put our faith in Jesus, we have no choice. We're slaves to sin. We can't help it. We just can't help it. Sinning. The interesting thing is, when we're living like that, we're usually not aware of the fact that we're sinning. Sin doesn't bother us when we're disconnected from God until His Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives. I remember going with a friend to a home where we were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a man, and we explained that 
Jesus died so that our sins could be forgiven. And he said, I, I don't think I've ever sinned. And Ed said to him, you can't think of a single time in your life when you did anything wrong. And he thought for a while, and then he said, well, there was one time when I got home late for supper and I didn't call my wife. I mean, he was living with a complete unawareness of the fact that he was a sinner, that we are all sinners. But now, because of our identification with Jesus in his death and resurrection, we are free. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are free to follow our good shepherd in the path of righteousness, living the right way as God intended we should. As baptized followers of Jesus, we have the freedom and the power to say no to sin. The power of the Holy Spirit within us enables us to see the things that are wrong in God's eyes and avoid them. So then we would ask the question, do Christians sin? Sadly, yes. I'm going to share with you an obvious fact. You're all aware of it anyway. Your pastor is a sinner. I need God's grace. I'm so glad that he forgives me when I sin. Christians don't have to sin. Unlike those who are without Christ, we have a choice. The power of God's Holy Spirit is available to keep us from sin. But if and when we do sin, we do not give up. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and He is just, and He will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will make us as clean and pure in His sight as if we had never done anything wrong in our life. The Apostle John goes on to write, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So what do we mean when we talk about dying to live? I think of the Apostle Peter. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to death. Luke 22-33. I'm willing to die with you, he said. But what God really wants is a living sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1 says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true Somebody said the problem with a living sacrifice is that we keep crawling off the altar. You know. Staying surrendered to God is where real life happens. There was a bishop in the city of Lyons in what is now France, a man by the name of Irenaeus. And along about AD 185, so about a 150 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the man wrote, The glory of God is man fully alive. Think about that. The glory of God is man fully alive. Today we have discussed the meaning and the necessity of baptism, a divine sacrament. The church has been given a second sacrament also. And we call it Holy Communion. As baptism celebrates our birth into a new life in Christ, in communion we remember again 
the one who died and shed his blood so that we may live freely and eternally. Brothers and sisters, we are free. As believers, followers in Jesus, we ought to be the freest and happiest people in the world. That doesn't mean we don't go through times of sorrow. It doesn't mean we don't go through times of struggle. It means that we are in Christ, and Christ is in us, and His Spirit gives us the power to live life the way God intends. Freely and Father God, today we want to thank you for Jesus. Today we want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. And today we want to thank you for a new life through faith in Jesus as your Spirit works in us to forgive our sins and make us the people you created us to be. We know that your Bible was written so that we would know how to have a relationship with you. And today we want to thank you for what we've read and studied from the scriptures. Thank you that Jesus was baptized because he wanted to do everything right in the right way, pleasing to the Father. And today because of Jesus, you have placed within us a desire to do what is right in your eyes, to be right with you, to have a relationship with you that results in a relationship with others that is based on the love of God. Thank you, Father, that you loved us first and proved it when Jesus shed his blood on that cross. As we come to Holy Communion, may we experience again the presence of Christ in our lives. In Jesus' name.